Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, one of our last Science Speaker Series events of the 2020-2021 academic year here at Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautical, Aeronautical University. Um, today's speaker is a graduate research fellow from The Ohio State University. Uh, Patrick um, is joining us. He did his undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Oklahoma, and he is almost done with his PhD now uh, at The Ohio State University. Uh, today he'll be talking to us about supernovae and in particular ways in which we can observe supernovae both from the ground and from space um, with very high precision. So without further ado, Patrick, please take it away. All right, thanks, Noel. Uh, yeah, like Noel said, uh, my name is Patrick. I'm a grad student at Ohio State. I do a lot of work uh, with tests and also with the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae. This is a, a ground-based survey for discovering supernovae that was based here out of Ohio State. I'm looking outside as snowflakes are falling and I'm a little sad. I'm not actually with you guys out in Arizona, but uh, we're going to make do. So now I know TESS isn't quite as famous as, you know, Hubble or something. So you may not know that much about it. But uh, so for a quick introduction, TESS stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Basically, uh, the science goal of this mission is to go put this satellite up in space, look at all the bright stars nearby to Earth, and look for the telltale dip in the brightness of that star when a planet passes in front of it. You can see uh, in the upper right here kind of a visual of what that looks like. Uh, and the idea for this, the main like motivation motivation for this, uh, is that if you find bright stars with planets, uh, you can do a lot easier follow-up with things like JWST, uh, the 10 meter class telescopes we have online now, or the 30 meter class telescopes that are coming online in the near future, uh, which is really exciting and great for exoplanet research. Now, TESS is the natural successor to a mission called Kepler. Kepler was sort of doing the same kind of transit detection science that TESS does, except uh, in a fairly different way. So uh, Kepler is built or was built on doing a small field, staring at it really, really deeply uh, for a very long period of time, looking for planets, uh, whereas TESS is trying to cover the entire sky. And in the process of doing that, the way you have to schedule your observations, you have a shorter baseline you cover a lot more area of the sky, which uh, in the process makes it a lot better for transients, so things like supernova, which I'm going to talk about a bit more here. But in terms of how TESS actually achieves that kind of uh, survey design, basically. So what TESS is, is it involves four relatively small lenses. So TESS, you can think of the lenses in TESS, they're pretty comparable in size to, if you go to like a football game and you look at the guy uh, with a big camera lens on the sideline, they're pretty comparable to that, actually. Uh, but it has four of them designed to do pretty wide field imaging, so 24 degrees by 24 degrees, all lined up in a row, and it just takes basically a two-frame per minute movie uh, of the sky for all for all the time that it's up there observing, except for the half day or so that it comes near the Earth to downlink the data. Uh, so it's just out there pointing, taking images all the time, which is really good. Uh, in terms of the, the longer baseline strategy, what Tesla does is it stares at those, takes two orbits, so about two weeks per orbit, uh, observing, taking those, again, two two frame per minute movies, and then every month or so it rotates around with a little bit of overlap between the sectors. Uh, most most prominently, you can see in the ecliptic pole, basically the center region of this uh, animation, you can see TESS has a nearly continuous viewing for a full year, which is really awesome if you get lucky and your transient or your variable star or whatever that you're interested in lies in that pole, you get nearly a full year of data with an image every 30 minutes, which is just unparalleled, you know, from the ground probably the best you could do is yeah, maybe an image a day, if you're lucky, is, is normally pretty good. So getting an image every half hour is just next level, really opening a whole new, whole new window of science you can do with TESS. Now, obviously TESS, it's in the name. The primary role of the mission is to be an exoplanet hunter. And it's very good at that because, you know, people at NASA, people at MIT have put in a lot of work with a lot of really smart people to make it good at that. And uh, so far it's found over 2,000 exoplanets well, exoplanet candidates. Uh, so far, these almost 100 have been confirmed. Uh, the reason for that gap is just that when you find your transit dip, you have to go spend a good bit of time getting spectroscopic follow-up and other uh, confirmation to be sure that what you're seeing is actually a planet and not just, uh, you know, unfortunate for you, eclipsing binary star or a uh, brown dwarf or something like that uh, that can masquerade as a transit as a planet. But in any case, Tesla's very good at its exoplanet stuff and they're 
could be and have been entire talks, entire conferences, probably a textbook's worth of material done on Tesla's an exoplanet mission. But I'm not going to talk about that too much here. I want to talk about TESS as a transient mission. So this is because TESS is up there observing you know, big slices of the sky. It, it observes something like 5 or 6% of the sky at any given time. Uh, a lot of non-exoplanet things are going on in that chunk of the sky that it's looking at at any given moment. And the ones that are interesting to me most are supernovae and tidal disruption events. That's what we've had uh, a lot of success looking at so far. So I'm going to talk about them a bit more in the future, but the short version is that supernovae are exploding stars, tidal disruption events, our stars getting torn apart by black holes, uh, test these both, and it's really great at doing science for both of them. So what it's not great at, though, is discovering them. So with tests, uh, you have an intrinsic about, on average, a week between when test takes images and when you could most quickly expect to see the data just because of the downlink pattern. You know, if it's out on its orbit, it takes an image. It has to get down to Earth before you could have any chance of seeing it. And in practice, they also, the, the MIT team wants to vet it before they make it available for public use. So you usually end up going about a month between when TESS takes an image of the sky and when you can get that image and do any science with it. Uh, which is fine. That's not really an issue with the mission. But it means that you need to have some other way to detect your supernovae uh, from the ground. Or, from, or I guess there are some other space missions that work too. But you need some way to detect it in order to trigger follow-up because TESS by itself is really powerful, but you really want to be able to leverage other resources as well because TESS is a single broadband infrared filter uh, and you would like to be able to have spectra, have uh, higher energy wavelength observations along with TESS to really like maximize the leverage you can get out of those TESS observations and to, to fill this gap, this need uh, with TESS in using it as a transient mission, we have a lot of ground-based surveys that have come in really, really helpful for this mission. So. I work, again, like I mentioned, on the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae. This is a robotic telescope survey unit based here out of OSU with telescopes placed around the world. And ever since TESS has launched, because we were aware that this was going to be probably a really good use case for TESS, and because our sensitivity as a survey is really well matched to TESS, we've been trying to monitor the TESS fields and increase cadence uh, ever since TESS launched. And this has been really successful for us, uh, for us and we've discovered a lot of cool TESS uh, like to cool transients in the test field because of this effort. And we were excited to see that ZTF has adopted a similar practice whenever a test is observing in the north where ZTF uh, can detect things. So that's really good. And then another nice thing about tests is that you might intrinsically think, oh, it has these small lenses. That's kind of bad, right? You know, we're in an era where 10 meter class telescopes are common ish, where 30 meter class telescopes are being designed. Like, what, what are you doing with 10 and a half centimeter lenses? But uh, the fact is, when you're limited to the range the test is, follow-up isn't that expensive, you know. CTF finds 2,000 supernovae for a year at magnitude 22 or 23, uh, which is good in a lot of ways in that you have big samples and you can do good science on those big samples. But if you're trying to do extensive follow-up campaigns of supernovae, it's better to have 10 magnitude 17 supernovae than 100 magnitude 21 supernovae just because it's a lot easier to convince a tech to give you 20 minutes to get a spectrum than it is to get three hours per spectrum or something like that. Uh, which is why TESS is really nice, because when it finds bright supernovae, it's pretty easy to convince folks to give you time to go follow them up. And then also, because of the way TESS observes the entire sky, uh, you're kind of, at varying times of its observing campaigns, able to leverage resources you might have in the Northern Hemisphere. Like I, as part of my work with OSU, spend a ton of time coming out to observe in Arizona on the large binocular telescope. So whenever TESS is in the north, we have time on the OBT to go get observations. Uh, whenever TESS is observing in the south, we can go to our friends in, with time on the South African Large Telescope, leverage that. We have a ton of uh, orbiting space satellites to do X-ray and UV observations. It's a really exciting way to bring a lot of observation, a lot of observational capabilities to bear on some cool fun science. Now, Okay, so that's great. You found your supernova or your tidal supernova, whatever interesting thing in tests. You, you've, done, you've gotten your ancillary data, and now you have your hands on the test data because they made it available. Now, if you're someone like me, you do a lot of observing on the ground. You're usually used to dealing with your biggest problems being the atmosphere. You know, I go to LBT and, oh, there's dust in the air, so we can't open this day, or smoke from nearby fires, or it's cloudy, or it's snowy, or it's rainy. Like, all these normal problems are tied to the atmosphere. And the, one of the really nice things about TESS is that it's above the atmosphere. None of those are real issues. You don't have to deal with them. But there are still some unique stuff you have to deal with with TESS, the most obvious of which and the most uh, 
thing we've lost in those data too, so far is what we call these scattered light artifacts. So because of the lens construction and just facts of optics, when you have tests orbiting up there, if the moon or the earth end up too close to like the line of sight of those cameras the test uses, you can get these uh, scattered light artifacts you can see sort of here in the in the PowerPoint, sort of the, the worm slowly moving around the image in the bottom one and the big flash in the image on the top. This is the biggest issue we have to deal with. You have to either try to model them out, which we've been able to do in some cases, and in other cases, you just kind of lose data for a little bit of time there. And then the other intrinsic limitations are that uh, while you're doing the orbit, you can't observe while you're doing the downlink. And then also the, the price you pay to get the really wide field of view that TESS has is that your pixels are pretty big. Uh, so there can be a lot of situations where you have multiple bright stars overlapping with one another on the pixels, which can complicate data reduction a little bit. And then at least when we started, one of the problems we had to deal with also was that since TESS was designed as an exoplanet mission, all of the pre-developed tools were pretty much built for finding exoplanets, which is just a very different problem than what we were trying to do with transients, because we don't need to see a half percent dip in the light curve. We're trying to follow the whole light curve. And we're also sensitive, or we also want to go to much fainter targets than the exoplanet uh, searches we're looking for. So with that in mind, we ended up deciding that the best thing for us to do was probably to just try to do our own image subtraction pipeline. So uh, for this, we were able to lean on our, our, our uh, significant experience with Assassin, because Assassin is built on image subtraction. And image subtraction uh, in general is a really nice technique for this, because it helps you deal with a lot of that source crowding issues by saying, we're going to remove those out. So anything that isn't varying just gets removed from that pixel. And in a, in a simple case, at least, it's kind of easy to understand, you know. So image subtraction is m mostly came into its own as a method for uh, transient surveys like Assassin to be better suited for finding uh, new transients. And you can think of the idea as the alternative would be you go up and you take an image of this galaxy every night for five, six years, and you go look for it and see if there's a new star, basically, is what you're doing. And, you know, you can see I put one in here. And if you've looked at this galaxy every night for five years, you'd probably be familiar with it enough that you could notice there's a new bright spot. But if you're looking through hundreds of these galaxies every day because that's what your survey is collecting and you haven't had your coffee yet this morning, when you're looking at this new image on the left, you might miss that dot, even though it's a pretty bright supernova. Whereas if you use image subtraction, where what you're getting on the right here is you've taken an image of this galaxy a bunch of times, you put together an average of all those images and you subtract what you know the galaxy looks like from any new image you take, suddenly the only thing in the image is the supernova. You've removed all the background of the galaxy, everything that's non-varying in that galaxy, and the supernova is staring you in the face. So this kind of data reduction technique is great for tests. Now, of course, in practice, it doesn't look quite as good as that. You can see here, here is what a, a real test image and image retraction sequence looks like. You can see this is the real uh, raw image you get from the MIT NASA team at the left. You do a first round of image subtraction, you get rid of some of the gradient, but you're still left with uh, a lot of scattered light structure you can see in the top middle panel. And you also have these lines are from the uh, just physical structure of the CCD, the, the metal straps that have to go into building it. And we can, we can model this out a little bit using the pipeline we have here, but in the end, which you can see on the right is our, our sort of final process images, you still have a few of these bright uh, artifacts. That's a kind of fundamental limit of image subtraction. You're always going to have those. But once you've modeled out the background, you have really nice images you can do a lot of science with. Now, in terms of the science we can do, uh, one of the most interesting things for me to study with tests has been supernovae. So supernovae, you've probably heard of. They're rare on human time scales, but not rare on astronomical time scales. If you, you or I sit through the rest of our lives, we'll probably see one or two uh, in the Milky Way. We're actually overdue by a century or two in terms of detecting one in the Milky Way. Uh, and then beyond the Milky Way, in terms of detecting them out in the cosmos, we're actually getting very, very good at that, especially with the uh, with, as ETF has come online, as Assassin has been operating. And in the future, when the Vera Rubin Telescope survey becomes online, we're going to be very, very good at finding probably thousands, tens of thousands of these in any given year. Uh, so generally, there are two kinds of supernovae. You have those that come from the death of massive stars and those that come from the death of things like of, of white dwarfs, which is what uh, the sun will become when it burns through all its fuel. Uh, these are fundamentally very different, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in the future. But the gist of it is that 
massive star, burns through all the fuel in its core, fuses it up to high iron, uh, and it can't continue living in that cycle anymore because fusing iron costs, costs energy instead of releasing energy. Uh, and in the process of trying to work with that iron core, it ends up collapsing on itself. The star with no pressure collapses on itself and then explodes in a supernova, which is a very different process from the white dwarf supernova, what we call thermonuclear or type 1a. I'll probably use those interchangeably where you have a white dwarf, which is just a star, well, sort of the remnant of a star, held up by quantum degeneracy pressure. And then when that gains enough mass to reach an unstable limit called the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, it becomes unstable and then explodes as a type 1a supernova. But for reasons that are, I'll talk about a little bit more, we're pretty unsure of exactly the process for which that one works. Now, of course, in practice, you don't have this nice video, you know, of your... You don't have, you're not watching Cosmos and you don't get to see your supernova go from star to explosion with, you know, arbitrary resolution. And instead, what you have is a point source that the best you can do is put it through a spectrograph and look at spectra. And that's how we, uh, in practice, define our supernova. So you'll, you'll take your, you know, you're looking through your data, you see a new supernova in the galaxy, you go look and see, say, big silicon absorption and no hydrogen. So you know that that's type 1A. Uh, and then you can move on from there to do more science. Or you see big, booming H-alpha p signy profiles, and you'll know that's probably a type 2. Um, and then there's a whole zoo of more detailed supernova spectra beyond that and supernova light curve uh, classification beyond that we can get into. But just the point for tests, at least, is nice that, be again, because the test supernovae are bright, you can pretty reliably get spectroscopic follow-up of them, which is nice because it as more and more uh, discoveries of supernova have been made and they become more and more regular. It's become a good bit more difficult to get spectroscopic follow-up of all of them just because spect spectra are expensive to obtain time-wise. Uh, another interesting thing is that if you were to, say, look at the Milky Way for 10 billion years, what would happen is, and, and to count the supernova that go off in it, you would note that about three quarter of them are core collapse supernovae, and only about a quarter are these type 1As, these thermonuclear detonations on white dwarfs. Uh, but obviously, we can't sit here for 10 billion years to do our supernova science. That's not uh, going to be a productive research method. So instead, what we do is we look out, try to calculate supernovae in all the galaxies that we can see with our telescopes. And when you actually go observing for supernovae, what you see is that about the, the, the rates basically shift. You go from one quarter of the supernovae being, that you find being type 1a to when you're actually observing, about three quarters of them being type 1a. Uh, and this is just because although both types of supernova actually generate pretty similar amounts of energy, uh, type 1a's are a lot more effective at converting that energy to radiation, to you know emitted light in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so you can see them out to all distances, and you see a lot more of them. So because of that, we found a lot more of them in tests. We find a lot more of them in every survey. So I'm going to start by talking about how we can use tests to study these. Now, before we get too far into it, you know, who cares about thermonuclear supernovae? Well, the answer is basically everyone. Uh, if you like living on rocky planets, these are uh, important ways for us to understand where uh, most of the elements involved with rocky planet formation come from. And I think the biggest thing in terms of uh, broader scientific impact for type 1As that we know of is that they are the reason we understand about three quarters of the universe exists. So back in the 90s, when we were first sort of undergoing our current cosmology revolution, it was that because type 1A supernovae are very well behaved, we understand quite well uh, how bright they become based on the shape of their supernova, so we can, or based on the shape of their light curve. Uh, so we can use them as a standard candle that we were able to look out to probe the expansion rate of the universe using these supernova and to realize that, in fact, the universe was expanding, which at the time, I don't think anyone really expected. So this was really exciting and led to us understanding that some three quarters of the universe has dark energy. So there's sort of this critical underpinning of our current cosmological understanding comes from these type 1A supernovae. So naturally, you might think, ah, oh, well, we must have a fantastic understanding of the physics of these supernovas since we can calibrate their light curves so well and so on and so forth. But actually, we really don't. I mean, we have a really good understanding of the fact that they come from the thermonuclear burning of white dwarfs is because you look at their spectra, the nuclear burning products that are in their spectra make a ton of sense to come from the burning of a white dwarf. Uh, and that's great. But how you actually get the white dwarf to gain mass to the point that it can explode when it hits the Chandrasekhar limit, 
Uh, it's a huge open debate that we haven't really solved. So it's kind of wild that these are so critically important to astronomy, and yet we don't really have a great understanding of where they come from. But basically, there's two main camps for uh, ideas to how to get them build to build mass. The idea, the first one being uh, what we call the single degenerate model. Here, degenerate just refers to uh, white dwarfs. White, white dwarfs are held up by degeneracy pressure, which is a quantum mechanical effect. Uh, so single degenerate means one white dwarf, double degenerate means two white dwarfs. And in the single degenerate model, you put your white dwarf in a close binary with some relatively normal star. A red giant probably makes the most sense because it's easier to accrete material from. Uh, and then you put them close on orbit, they accrete material from that, that material accretes onto the surface of the white dwarf. Uh, and then it slowly builds mass, hits the Hunter Shaker limit, and explodes. Now this is conceptually a very nice uh, system in that you have your white dwarf building to a pretty consistent limit, accreting pretty similar hydrogen and helium material in all cases. So it's aesthetically nice as a turn as a way to get uh, standardizable candle, you know, outcomes from the explosion. But for reason I'll talk about in a second, there's a bit bit of a tension, I would say, with the observations and this model. So more and more recently, people have been looking into more, more seriously the double degenerate model where you have two white dwarfs, you set them up in a close in orbit, they in spiral, losing energy to gravitational wave radiation, and eventually merge. Uh, and then when they merge, they're over the time to take our moment, and this leads to a type 1a explosion. And I think for the last 10 or 15 years, this has more or less been uh, the state of the supernova field of people picking a side, arguing about it, sort of going back and forth. Full disclosure, I, I am team cap on this one. And the reasons I'm team cap on this one is that uh, there are some observational predictions made by the double or the single degenerate scenario that we just don't really see that much. So you can see here uh, sort of a visual for what it looks like when you ignite a supernova near a companion star like this. And it, not surprisingly, uh, should impact what you can see from the supernova when you light it off near an expanded star like this. Uh, the first of which is that as you slam, you know, a solar solar mass's worth of material at 10,000 kilometers a second into the uh, outer layers of this star, you should strip off some of those outer layers. And at late times when the supernova has expanded and cooled a bit, uh, you should be able to take a spectrum of that supernova, see in now that it's optically thin, and see uh, narrow emission features from those uh, companion material that you've stripped off. And people have been doing this for a long time because it's a known uh, feature of this single degenerate model, and we haven't really been able to see it. The other thing that this model predicts is that when you slam into that star, you should have some bit of emission created just by the interaction of that uh, high energy, high velocity ejecta slamming into the star, and you should have a little bump basically in the light curve that you can look for. And this hasn't really been looked into until recently because you need the high cadence observations of something like a TESS uh, or a Kepler or just the luckiest ground-based survey in the world basically to get it. And until recently, we haven't had the chance to look for those effectively. But now that we can, uh, we're able to say kind of confidently that both of these are not a very common occurrence. You know, it, you'll find them occasionally. They're probably, it's probably the case that single degenerate scenarios happen on occasionally in nature. Like it's not that they never happen, but at least in my opinion, uh, it's probably not the most likely explanation for most type 1As. So I mentioned that uh, <clears throat> test is great for starting to test some of these, and there's a bit of a wrinkle to that. So when you're looking for this early time emission, it is a very viewing angle dependent thing. You have to be on the right side of the supernova. Basically, if you, one second, if your supernova ejecta slams into the star and creates, you know, some energetic outburst there, but you're on the other side of the supernova, you're not going to see any emission from interactions with the companion star because it can't process its way through, you know, an entire solar mass's worth of superheated ejecta that's optically thick. So you basically have about a 15% chance of seeing anything for any individual given event just based on viewing angle effects. Uh, but the nice thing about TESS is it's going to operate for a long time. It's going to detect a lot of type 1As. And uh, so far, at least, we haven't had any detections of this feature. So the idea will be that as TESS continues to operate, and as we get to do our follow-up to the initial paper, which only had six events, uh, we should see either we'll find the smoking gun for the single degenerate, and that'll be exciting because we'll have, you know, aha, this is what's happening. This is great. 
uh, or we'll just continue to build more and more non-detections until we have a robust, statistically valid uh, way of saying this is probably wrong. Now, I did say for both of these that detections are rare. It's not that they never happen, it's that they're rare. Uh, so earlier when tests had been running for actually only a couple months when we found this one, uh, there was a paper by Juna Kohlmeyer noting that Assassin 18TB, this otherwise pretty normal looking type 1A, had the kind of hydrogen emission we would expect to see uh, from companion interaction, uh, which is really exciting. You can see here the black spectrum has that narrow, strong hydrogen emission feature and the red one, which is a more normal type 1A, doesn't have it. Uh, so that was really exciting. That looked pretty much like what we thought we would see if this was a single degenerate uh, event. But with only one spectrum, it's hard to say for sure. You know, there are other mechanisms that can cause hydrogen emission. You could have uh, interaction with a moderately dense CSM, other more exotic things. So, you know, no observational problem will not be solved with more data. And fortunately, we had a lot more, including the form of a test-like curve. So another nice thing about that H-alpha feature is that because it was blue shifted, we knew it was coming towards us a little bit. Uh, we knew that we weren't really constrained by the viewing angle effects. Like it wasn't a 15% chance that we would see it for this one. It was near certain to because if the swept up companion material is what was causing that H alpha, it would mean we were looking towards the supernova along the line of sight where that star, where that companion star would be. Uh, but when we went and looked at the test like curve, we didn't see any bump at all, which was, you know, a little bit unfortunate. It would have been really exciting to find a nice smoking gun for the single degenerate scenario and start building a statistical case for how often they occur. Uh, but instead, it seems like after more spectroscopic follow up, the most likely explanation is that that H alpha was probably from CSM interaction. So the hunt goes on for single degenerate smoking guns. But for test stuff, I also want to take a second to talk about core collapse supernovae. So I think. Outside of the cosmological impact, core collapse supernovae are actually more important than type 1As for a couple of reasons. The mo uh, most obvious of which is that they're just, they're intrinsically more common than type 1As. There's about three times as many of them. And also because of the way their physics works, they are more important for gas dynamic. Like they're, they're putting energy into heating gas and uh, dynamics of the systems they're in instead of just light that they're sending out. So we don't detect them as readily, but if you're doing say, galactic evolution simulations, which is what's shown here. All the little blue specks going off all the time are supernova that are driving uh, all of the gas dynamics. It's critical to have a good treatment of core collapse supernovae and how they affect your results. So uh, it's also it's important for us to build a better understanding of these moving forward. Now, one nice thing about these relative to type 1As is that we have a really good handle on what their progenitors are. Uh, at least the physical systems. The, the details of the physics are still very much open question, but the systems themselves, we know very much to be these high mass, very large stars, you know, typically bigger than about eight solar masses between 500 and 1,000 solar radii. And we know this partly because it's just a natural consequence of our understanding of stellar evolution, uh, but also we have direct detections of a number of these supernova. So things like 1987A, you get lucky and you just have a nice high resolution image of the galaxy where the supernova goes off before the supernova explodes. You can go back and pinpoint the stars that uh, subsequently exploded to cause the events, which is really exciting to have that kind of certainty in supernova physics, because a lot of times you, just, you can't get it. So I talked a little bit about the basics of supernova, a core collapse supernova physics earlier. Uh, you have your high mass star, it burns through the elements in its core and it fuses them to progressively heavier elements until they hit iron, at which point uh, you're no longer generating energy and you collapse your core and the outer envelope of the supernova collapses in on the core uh, and then bounces off and you get your supernova. But in terms of what you actually see, the first thing you'll see if you have the just complete ideal case observation of the supernova is what we call shock breakout. So here, uh, the shock wave from your supernova reaches the surface of the star superheats the surface of the star for this very brief moment, basically about the light crossing time of the star, which will be 30 minutes or so for an average supergiant, you see this brilliant flash in the X-ray and ultraviolet, uh, which is awesome in that it can be a direct probe of the progenitor star if you can observe it. Now, it's really hard to observe for basically two reasons. The first being that it's incredibly short. So you have to be luckily looking at that star when it happens. And it's also in the X-ray and ultraviolet where most of our uh, time domain surveys are in the optical and near-infrared so the signal's weaker. But with the time scale, it's sort of well-matched for tests and calculator if you get a bright enough 
event. And in fact, Kepler probably detected shock breakout for a core collapse supernova that it saw. So we're sort of hoping in the future, we haven't got a really confident shock breakout detection for an individual event with tests yet. But moving forward, if testing can get a fortunate enough, like a bright enough core collapse to go off in it, uh, we might be able to study this. Uh, what we've been able to do with tests so far, though, is a nice sample size study. So here is uh, just some sample light curves from our paper we did last year, where we had 20 bright core collapse events from tests. You can see they're pretty nice light curves. Again, 30 minute cadence is just fantastic. Uh, the one thing we wanted to do with these was try to probe the presenters. So first we tried fiddling with some semi-analytic models. So these treat supernovae as black bodies, basically parameterizing on uh, whether or parameterizing based on the progenitor radius, progenitor mass, supernova explosion energy, things like that. Uh, and the, the fits we get are great. You know, you look up here in the upper right, the lines go through the data, that's exciting. But when we went and looked at the physical parameters for these, uh, they were basically nonsense. We, we know supernova have to explode within a few factors of 10 to 51 ergs, and these were a bunch of the fits saying 50 times 10 to the one ergs. And we know for a fact that these are exploding red supergiants, so they're, you know, 500 to 1,000 solar radii, and most of these are clustered down here at like 30 solar radii. So uh, it was very wrong. We were very confused about this for like six months until we eventually realized the problem is that these models were designed for the UV, uh, and in the ultraviolet light curves evolve very quickly. So a bunch of physical physical uh, approximations that they made for these models just don't work in the near infrared, where light curves last for 90 days on the peak or 90 days or so while they're still bright. Uh, so instead, what we went and did was we compared to a bunch of computational models. So these, you evolve your supernova or you evolve your progenitor star with something like MESA, like a stellar evolution code, and then you get a realistic star at the end and you explode it using a code called SNEC, the supernova exploding code. And then you get out pretty reasonable, physically viable light curves at the end. And so we took the light curves from a paper by Morozova et al. We converted them into what, what tests would see of those model light curves if tests were able to look at them. And we noticed here in the bottom right, there's a really tight relation between how big the star is physically and how quickly the light curve rises to peak. So we took that relation and we applied it to our data. Basically, we, we took, you know, how quickly did our light curve rise to peak? Okay, and we fit to that line. What, what you know, size star does that translate to? <clears throat> and we compared that to the known galactic red supergiant population, and they seem to agree very, very well, which is exciting. Uh, they both cluster around 600 solar radii, about 11 solar mass star. Uh, so that's great. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to build this uh, out further and further as we collect more and more type two like with tests. And this would be exciting because as we fill it in, we might get a handle, an, an empirical handle on uh, islands of explodability through test. But basically, what, what type of high mass stars do and do not explode a supernova? Because we know and we expect some fraction of supernovae or some fraction of progenitors not to explode a supernova to instead directly collapse as black holes. Uh, so it'll be nice to have tests as a potential direct test for this. Now, uh, the last thing I want to talk about that we can do with tests is a little more niche than supernovae. Uh, these are called tidal disruption events. They're basically, if a star gets too close to a black hole, it can get uh, disrupted by the gravity of the black hole and absorbed by the black hole. And then in the process of accreting about half of that star, sort of like an AGN, the black hole will flare up in a really brilliant display. Now these, sort of unlike supernova, are not critical to a lot of areas of astronomy. They're sort of nice in that uh, they're a probe of otherwise quiescent black holes, but it's weird because I've never really had a problem convincing people that a star getting torn apart by a black hole is like a cool thing that we should study, you know? It's a, it's a common problem for a lot of astronomy, like the, the people who study dust have to like convince people it's cool, but I've, I've never had an issue with, uh, with TDEs. So, so far the single best transient we found with TESS is in fact the TDE. So this was Assassin 19 VT back in 2019, uh, happened to lie right in that continuous viewing zone, that place TESS is always observing. So we have a full year's worth of data watching this so that we know it's quiescent before the tidal disruption event happens. We have a perfect freaking light curve on the way up. I mean, we're able to look at this and get a high quality power law fit to the start of the rise. It was actually surprising when we did that power law fit. Uh, it, it's fit basically perfectly by a T squared power law rise, which is what you would expect if you just took a sphere and expanded it. 
it's actually it's not unusual for a supernova. You you sort of expect to see that for a supernova, uh, but for a TDE, it was very weird because you can see here in the left is a simulation of what the actual like stellar material is supposed to do in a TDE, and you can see it doesn't look anything like a sphere. So it was very surprising to see that we got a T squared uh, initial rise out for Assassin Night TBT, but. That's what we got, and it's going to be very interesting to see as we move forward with Assassin's Night TBT because we were able to trigger on it so early and get uh, such a complete, really detailed data map, data set for it uh, that TDE theory has to kind of catch up with it because there just hadn't been, no, no TDE had been caught early enough to have constraining data, basically, for that early first week, week and a half of the rise. So all the theories kind of disagreed for a bit around there. Uh, and moving forward, they're going to have to adjust, and we'll see if it changes significantly the field. And now the last event I want to talk about, uh, which has been our most recent one, is Assassin 14 KO. So this one, uh, we found back when Assassin had pretty much just come online. It was back in 2014. We saw, you know, this transient source rise out of the center of the galaxy. We took a spectrum, and we saw H alpha. Uh, we sort of figured it was a core collapse supernova, and didn't do much more with it. <clears throat> But over the last summer, I was talking to Anna Payne, a student at Hawaii, and we were looking at AGN-like curves and tests, and this one looked a little weird, and I told Anna that. And she went and looked back through the data and noticed that it basically comes back kind of like Old Faithful every 114 days, pretty much on the dot, it has another one of these outburst events, uh, which is weird because Core Collapse, core collapse Supernova can't do that. There's, you know, maybe hand away some stuff to get one, one more, like, double peak in the light curve. You could maybe get a light echo or something. <laughs> but there's no way to get it every 114 days flashing back to comparable magnitude to what it had at the initial supernova. Uh, so we went looking more and more into it, and I, at this point, after getting a lot of spectra and looking at the test data and how it compares to Assassin 19BT in a very similar fashion, uh, the most likely explanation seems to be that it is probably a partial tidal disruption event happening every time the star comes near the black hole. So you just have a star in a 114-day orbit, go around, comes back in, loses like 30 Jupiter masses or so was the estimate of material, which then gets accreted on a black hole and then the star goes back out, comes back in and does it again, which is really, really cool because this has actually never been seen before. Uh, it had been predicted for a while, but we'd never seen a confident detection of one until this test discovery. So that's really fun. And this one is particularly nice in that not only do we get to study more TDEs as test goes on, we get to study this particular TDE indefinitely as long as test continues to operate which should be for another at least 10 or 15 years which is really cool so uh with that i can just leave these up here happy to chat with noel but i think the main, main upshot i want to leave you guys with is that TESS, although it has an official name is actually the title of the events in supernova satellite it's just a fantastic tool for transient science uh just many facets of it and we have a lot a lot more exciting stuff coming on the way Well, that was very exciting. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, so anyway, this was a phenomenal talk. I really like what you're able to do with the uh, tests, um, light curves, and how we're able to, you know, exploit these data that are being taken as, you know, they look for planets to do some other really cool astrophysics. Um, I haven't seen any discussion come up in the YouTube yet. Um, for anyone that may have questions. So again, if anyone's uh, watching right now and has questions, please feel free to throw those in the chat and we'll be glad to answer those. Um, in, the in the meantime, um, that last object you showed, that tidal disruption on an elliptical orbit, has, uh, has there been any modeling done of what the binary properties would have to be or anything like that? or Not a ton yet so far, except that we... <laughs> There, there was brief consideration that it might be just a binary of two supermassive black holes, uh, but eventually the spectra seemed a little more consistent with it being this, but obviously more data will be helpful in this case, so we'll, we'll see moving forward, and which is the nice thing about this one, though, because it because it does repeat so consistently we can get a lot of nice data, and there'll definitely be a follow-up paper in the next year trying to fully nail down what's happening. All right. Uh, is, is there any chat? Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything major coming up in the chat. So for everyone that came and joined us today, uh, we do thank you for joining us uh, in the Science Speaker Series. 
Uh, Patrick, I wish we could have had you coming up after you went observing or something like that. But unfortunately, COVID just isn't allowing that quite yet. Um, uh, and as a general advertisement, in about two weeks, we will have our uh, graduating seniors in space physics uh, that are doing capstone projects, giving a discussion about their results that they have from their uh, senior projects as they get ready to graduate and go off to grad school or uh, into industry. Um, so uh, with that in mind, since I'm not seeing other questions today, um, I would like to just thank everyone again. And thank you, Patrick, very much for a lovely talk that you gave today. Um, it certainly is fascinating to see these uh, great supernovae results and to see the breakout away from the core collapse is going to be a huge insight into how these things work. So thank you. Thank you.